Hello, and welcome to the Collider Podcast. I'm Collider Senior Editor Matt Goldberg, and with me is Managing Editor Adam Chitwood. Howdy, folks. Today, we'll be talking about the Lord of the Rings trilogy and the Hobbit trilogy, both recently arrived on 4K HD Blu-ray Ultra. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I would just say 4K. I don't I don't know. Hold the on. Whole... Hold on. I have a question. Are you in Mount Doom right now? I am in Mount Doom. I forget okay. the taste of strawberries. <laughs> <laughs> or the minds of Moria. It's very dark is what I'm saying. It's very it's dark. Like, this I'm is downstairs. a good joke. My, my wife is on a conference call right now, and I don't want like her sound to like leach <laughs> into the podcast. And people are like, why, why in the background is there, am I hearing something about transportation? <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. Um, there are but, no trains in Mordor. <laughs> if there were, it'd be a lot easier to get there. Um, <laughs> So yeah, we're going to talk a bit about Lord of the Rings first and sort of its impact. And then we'll talk a bit about the Hobbit trilogy and then we'll finish up with recently watched. But uh, so I I watched uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy on 4K and Adam watched to the Hobbit trilogy on 4K. Um, I will say straight off the bat, if you're, if you're curious, like, should I get the 4K? I would say yes. Like don't get rid of your old discs because they don't have the special features on these like and those are like especially in the extended editions those are some really in-depth making of that's like it's like film school in a box yeah um but i will say like in terms of quality like the films have never looked better but they still look like they should they don't feel like overly mastered they don't feel too polished they just feel like they've been brought up to date i guess is sort of the best way to put it but they don't I don't know. They don't feel too old or too new. They just feel like they should. Um, so if you're if you're thinking like, should I pull the trigger on the 4Ks? I would say yes. Um, but yeah, and, you know, and in terms of Lord of the Rings, I watched that making a video that you wrote up where Jackson talked about remastered because he remastered the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy and the Hobbit trilogy in 4K. Mm -hmm. um, but he talked about being able to kind of hide bad CGI by just kind of changing the contrast and the coloring. So he didn't do they didn't do any new visual effects like he did in George Lucas it. Um, but everything kind of just looks better, kind of like looks a piece of a whole. Um, and I'll talk about this when we get to the Hobbit, but the Hobbit trills, you finally look like real movies. So that's a plus. Yeah, no, I mean, so for, for Lord of the Rings, it's it's fascinating sort of revisiting like, because I love these movies and I've loved them. You know, I'm not a huge fan of the books. Uh, Tolkien's writing style, that sort of Oxford professor, heavy prose style doesn't really work for me. I think his. The, I think the the world building is sound, but like it's also the kind of writing where it's like I will describe, you know, in depth what these characters are wa are walking up a hill, <laughs> and it's like you can just you can make that much faster. And it's like no, you need to know what the wind was like, and the and what they were carrying, and it's just it's very detailed. Um, it reads and so, sometimes it reads like the book of Genesis. It does. Like, it's just, it's very <laughs> detailed. And some people like love that. Like they just get really into it. But for me, it's just, it's, it, I, I, it, the momentum of it is, can, I, it took me multiple tries just to get through Fellowship of the Ring as a book, because like I'd get to the Tom Bombadil stuff and I'd be like, what is happening? Why are we here? Um, and so I've I always didn't found get out, fun, fun fact, when the movie was coming out, I wanted to read the books for the first time and I got, I thought I made a heavy chunk in it, but I only got to Bilbo's birthday. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> I was so, like, okay. And the movie came out and I was like, I'm just going to go see the movie. I'm not going to wait until I finish reading what happens. Next. It took me a year to read the Lord of the Rings books. And I know like for some <laughs> people like that'll be like blasphemy and, and what have you. But I just, I prefer the movies. I think the, what Jackson did in adapting them is he, there's a clear love for the material, but he's not so precious about it that he's like, I must include every little thing or else I'll upset the fans. Like, I think he adapted it in the way that someone who loves the material knows how to do. Yeah. And what struck me watching at this time is just, they're so different. They're just so earnestly themselves um, in a way that I almost feel like had they arrived in the age of like social media, people would have just been dunking on them too much or like, it would just be too, like, we're, we're just so knowing now. Um, I feel like sort of, they arrived just before the dam burst, like internet culture was on the rise, but not so much that like, you can't have, you know, Bilbo saying finest weed in all the Shire, you know, like, and it's like, yeah, we, Peter Jackson knows what he's saying, but he's not, it's not so overt, you know, that it's not, 
the films aren't knowing about themselves. They're not winking at the camera. They're not trying to, if anything, they are saying we are very confident in our world building and you need to come in rather than being like, what can we do to make this as painless as possible for any audience? Yeah. And so I feel like, you know, Peter Jackson didn't try to make them cool is what you're he saying. didn't. And they're not like, that's the thing. They're cool by virtue of just being themselves but they're very nerdy. They're very unabashedly what they are. And I just feel like because it is just so invested in its own world and the, by the fact that like it doesn't look cheap, um, even though like, I mean, it cost, I think a hundred million per film, which is expensive at the time, but like nowadays would not be like, that's on the lower end of a blockbuster. And I mean, yeah. part of the reason they were able to do it at that price point is because of the news, because of filming in New Zealand and because like Weta was like this up and coming effects studio and they were sort of handled everything. And it was sort of kind of done like away <laughs> from the world, but it's still a film that's like in a weird way, getting away with something to be this fantasy that's just itself. And I really haven't seen anything like that until honestly, you know, I mean, there were imitators, but I didn't see anything done on that scale until I would honestly say like 2016's Warcraft. That was like the last time I saw like a big budget, unabashedly high fantasy film. And I'm not saying like that film is as good as Lord of the Rings, but that's sort of to stress how rare it is that anyone would even attempt that. Even Game of Thrones is like, it's trying to be cool. Like it's got this. Oh, Game of Thrones hates being a fantasy. Like yeah. Game of Thrones, you can tell straight off the bat, like, Benny Off and Weiss hate the fact that they're in a fantasy world. Like yeah. they, no, like I think seriously, like they kind of wanted to be more like the show is at its strongest when it's really just about people in rooms talking yeah. and about politics, which is really what the show is in its first three to four seasons. Cause they didn't have the budget to do a bunch of ice zombies and dragons. So they mm -hmm. didn't do it that much. Um, because of the moment you start moving into fantasy realms, like they're just not really that, they're more like for them, they were more in sort of like, Ooh, who are John? What's John Snow's lineage, which is a completely like non mythological thing. It has nothing to do with like, you know, why, you know, is this family can't be burned by dragons or where do ice zombies come from? And what is this? And what is that? And like, they did it, but it was always kind of begrudging. And it was sort of like left to the fans to figure out like the mythology of it all. I just feel like game of Thrones is much more like it's very much like war of the roses, but it happens to have dragons. Yeah. 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 I mean, I like that. That earnestness I think is really what drew me to the Lord of the Rings in the first place. I mean, I, I was not, uh, I hadn't read any high fantasy. It was not necessarily a huge fantasy fan. Um, I hadn't seen legend, which I have now seen and don't care for. At all. I just watched it this weekend <laughs> and I also did not care for legend. <laughs> yeah. So fantasy is um, any, I wasn't even hugely into Harry Potter at that time. I mean, I was, so when the first Lord of the Rings came out, I was, I think like 14. Um, and I hadn't read the Harry Potter books and like I saw, I, I don't know, I had seen the first movie somehow, but I wasn't like super into those. So a long way, long way of saying like I was not in the bag for Lord of the Rings, but it just seemed so interesting and so compelling. And I remember seeing it with uh, two of my best friends because it came out on Christmas and just felt like this really cool thing. And we all loved it. One of them came out being like, that was a terrible ending. And we we're like, you know, there's two more. And he was like, really? Because <laughs> he was an idiot. <laughs> um but yeah, I don't know. I was really blown away by Fellowship of the Ring, and it was really interesting to see the kind of snowball of acclaim that happened. I mean, that, that film was nominated for Best Picture. It was nominated for a number of other Oscars, got this critical acclaim. Um, and like even the production of Lord of the Rings is really fascinating to me. There's this really great book uh, called, I think, uh, Anything You Can Imagine uh, by an author named Ian Nathan, which is entirely about the making of Lord of the Rings trilogy. And it gets into The Hobbit a little bit. It's a really thick book. Um, but like Jackson was not even necessarily a fan of Lord of the Rings or Tolkien. Uh, he was so coming off the Frighteners, he had built essentially like in New Zealand, you know, he made it big on bad taste in these kind of splashy horror movies. Heavenly Creatures got him critical acclaim. And then he made the Frighteners, which was one of the very first CG movies. And to do the Frighteners, he had created Weta, this um, digital studio to do visual effects and stuff. Um, and essentially, he was looking for a movie to keep Weta in business. So he was going to do King Kong. That was going to happen at Universal um, because it would need 
visual effects. And he was like, oh, I can have my company do it. And therefore, like, we can get ourselves off the ground. King Kong fell apart. And I think it was his wife who, like, picked up. Well, he doesn't Lord have a Rings. wife. His partner. His partner, Fran Walsh. Partner, Fran yeah. Walsh. Um, I think it was her who was, she was a big fan of Lord of the Rings, I think. And uh, so he had gotten approached or something. And so that's how it came to him. But again, it was kind of this excuse to do his effects company. Not that he didn't care for the story or anything. And then they brought in Philip Boyens, who was a friend of a friend who was just obsessive about Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. Um, and the three of them really made this trilogy together. But even then, like they shot all three films at the same time. But each year, so after the Fellowship of the Ring was this massive success, uh, the studios involved paid for them to go back and do additional photography for two towers. So they spent two to three months doing more shooting, writing new scenes for two towers. Same thing happened after two towers. They went back, did, I think, like three months of additional photography for Return of the King. So that's why the film seemed to get a little more polished and pristine as they go along. Um, and I think they got a little bit of additional photography for fellowship, too. But it was kind of the Harry Potter deal where the cast was used to going back to New Zealand every year to do more scenes and stuff. And some of the best stuff came out of that. I think the, um, the Smeagol talking to himself scene was like, just, uh, like Peter Jackson was looking at a cut and like, they needed something to tell the audience, like the Smeagol Gollum dynamic. Um, and he didn't have time to do it. So he had Fran Walsh write it and he didn't have time to direct it. So Fran Walsh directed it. So they just went off, got Andy circus, got like a little set, had made Frodo and Sam asleep so they didn't even have to get Elijah Wood or Sean Astin, just like two bodies sleeping in the background. And that's like how one of the most iconic scenes of the trilogy happened, just kind of, kind of like on the fly during additional photography while Peter Jackson was busy. Like it was a very collaborative meeting medium to make these films come together. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you look at the making of those films, I think they really put to rest this notion that like, the best films are the ones where everything is planned out. They follow the script yeah. to the letter. Everything goes exactly as planned, nothing off track. And that's how you make a good movie. And it's like, no, you can make a terrible movie that way just because you planned everything. I get it that like, you know, a failure to plan is planning to fail. But in movies, which are such a collaborative art form, you have to have that room to be creative and sort of say, this isn't working. How can we change it? How can we make this better? So you know, when they're filming Fellowship, you know, or any of these films, they're still getting like new sides on the day. Uh, sides are script pages. Um, so, you know, where they're getting a little new lines or, or something has changed or been tweaked to make it as good as it can be when they're filming. Um, and that doesn't mean they like, recast oh, cast one of the main roles. Like, yes. Four weeks into shooting. Yes, they did. Stuart Townsend was originally going to play Aragorn and they're like, this isn't working. Can we get Viggo Mortensen? <laughs> and I'm glad they did. Like yeah. you, you need that level of flexibility. And again, a lot of the stuff is kind of kismet. Like originally Lord of the Rings was going to be two films set up at Miramax. Um, Harvey Weinstein was a kind of a scumbag and Peter Jackson really didn't really want to work with him and it kind of fell apart. Um, and they were able to get it over to New Line and Bob Shea, the head of New Line, is like, well, aren't these three movies? <laughs> aren't there three books? And yeah. they're like, well, yeah. And they're like, well, then we should probably have three movies <laughs> and, instead of trying to cram them all into one thing. And I think, again, like sometimes you get lucky with that yeah. stuff. This notion that the thing is, is if if everyone knew the right way to make a movie, they would do it that way. If you, if it was just, if it was as simple as building a car, you'd have it come off the assembly line, but that's not how art works. That's not how filmmaking works. And I think the Lord of the Rings films are kind of a testament to that flexibility. Yeah. Didn't they have like Sauron on the battlefield at the end of Return of the King originally? Maybe. I think there was I mean, like a physical embodiment of Sauron who fought Aragorn, Aragorn on the battlefield at the end of Return of the King outside the gates of, uh, yeah. you know, that one place. No, and, I, and look, I'm not saying, I mean, again, like things change and, and I'm not someone who thinks like every single thing about Lord of the Rings is perfect. I do love these movies, but I'll, 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 I'll meet you halfway that like, I think Return of the King ends awkwardly, not because it has too many endings, but because they use a lot of fade outs, which gives the impression that the film is about to end, yeah. but it keeps going. And so that's frust like, I think that was an editing issue, not a storytelling issue or even the fact of like and i forget if this comes from the books or not but like the ghost that aragorn uses to win the battle <laughs> and it's sort of i i get it like it is sort of unfulfilling to be like oh slimer came along and like wiped out all the orcs <laughs> and now they won but like you can't just do the same like that's sort of you know <sighs> 
that's the battles aren't really the emotional um they're fun action scenes but the character stuff is where the films live you know yeah. and i think that to me is what sets it apart like and and honestly when you're getting in if you know to talk about game of thrones when you're getting into the later seasons of game of thrones and those huge battle scenes like the emotional stakes start to vanish yeah because it all just becomes like well who's gonna live and who's gonna die and you know what's gonna happen but really uh, you know for me i feel like you know if you look at the battle of helms deep that's just great character stuff. Like there's battle stuff interspersed, but they know when to, to leave the battle to go to so where, where Sam and, and uh, Frodo doing, or, you know, what are Mary and Pippin doing and sort of trying to sort of address all these storylines while also moving the characters forward. And I just like that, you know, everyone gets a character arc in these movies. Like everyone, even if they're not like a major character, like I think, Faramir is like, I think in the extended edition, he gets way more time. And in the book, he gets way more time, but he's not like a, he's not like an Aragorn level character, but he still gets an arc. He still gets a clear, like, if you're asking me like, what is Far Faramir's arc in the Lord of the Rings movie? I'd be like, he is a guy who is in the shadow of his older brother, Boromir. His father doesn't really respect him. He will do anything for his father's respect. He nearly dies trying to get it. That's a story. That's a character right there. And it doesn't have to be like this whole thing, but the fact that everyone gets it, like I can tell you where, where Eowyn is coming from. I can tell you where even Wormtongue is coming from. I think that's just really strong character stuff. And then you kind of build in the world and the, and the set pieces around that. Yeah. I mean, I think it speaks volumes that like, as I was watching the trilogy, when it, when it came out, um, one of my biggest like yearnings, one of my biggest like emotional connections was I just wanted Sam, Frodo, Mary and Pippin to be back together again. Like I wanted them to see each other again. And I think that's strong storytelling. I think the foundational work in Fellowship of the Ring is really tremendous. Um, that it introduces all these characters, but also humanizes them at the same time. It also should be said that all three of these films feel like films, like they're satisfying in and of themselves. They don't feel like pieces of a whole, really. No, no, they don't. They you, you get. I mean, they fit together, but they fit together, and like you know, no one would be like, "Oh, that's the ending of Fellowship." Well, maybe your friend would be. <laughs> that's the ending <laughs> like, of what? Fellowship. <laughs> what? But they know they you, just feel like ha you feel like something. You feel like something has been completed, and 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 to be fair, that's different than even the books. In the books, I'm pretty sure Boromir's death comes at the beginning of the Two Towers, but they moved it to the end of. Excuse me. They moved it to the end of Fellowship. Because it was the smarter move. Yeah. Because yeah, and need... even Shiloh was supposed to be at the end of Two Towers and they yes. moved it to the and they moved Return it... of the King. Yeah. And I think it's because you sort of need it's just where the films or you know, organically kind of are provide a nice break point. Yeah. Put it in, you know. But I feel like, you know, again, what you're saying about you want these characters to get back together, it's interesting again with you know the way these movies are timed. I mean, we're in the age of superheroes right now, and, and sort of um you know, a Blade came out in 98 and then X-Men was 2000 and Spider-Man was 2002. But superhero movies weren't really enough of a thing that they would be like, these all, like, the, they didn't have the level of influence that they do now. If you were to make Lord of the Rings now, and, you know, again, we'll see what Amazon does with their adaptation. But if you were to make these movies now, I my fear is they'd be like, no, no, no. Everyone has to be more heroic. Like Frodo has to do some more heroic things. Mm -hmm. And the thing I really like, especially on this recent viewing, is that Frodo is not really a hero. He survives and he does something. He, you know, he he puts himself through the grinder. But at the end, he fails. <laughs> and like, he doesn't do the heroic thing. And I feel like that's a really powerful and confident move. And I know that's what the book does, but just because the book does it, that doesn't mean like a studio would be like, yeah, may maybe he doesn't, you know, <laughs> you know, screw over the world. <laughs> <laughs> Sam is a, I think Sam is a really heroic figure. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love that dynamic. between Frodo and Sam, Sam is heroic, but he also is heroic in a very human, in a very humble way. Like he, he does it through like big speech, like through sort of his heart and his speeches. He's not like, Aragorn is sort of your typical action hero character, him and Legolas and, and to a lesser extent, Gimli. Those are sort of your action heroes. But but Sam is kind of like the the heart of the movies. Yeah. So, yeah, I just I mean, they, they work incredibly well. I just I was I was taken aback at how different they feel from what we normally expect of blockbusters. Yeah, I mean, you can just imagine like them trying to market it in today's marketplace of like trying to turn it into like a, you know, 
Frodo's got this impossible task, but there's a bunch of like wisecracks and like like a Marvel movie. <laughs> like, yeah, no, it'd have to be funnier. It'd have to be faster. It would have to be, you know, more like, you know, how can we make the battles even bigger? Um, I love how patient the the pacing of these movies is. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things I love about it. No, I mean, and, and they're patient to the extent of, again, going to how unconcerned they are with the audiences. <laughs> like there are like, there will frequently be scenes of like, Aragorn and Arwen dreaming of each other. And like, that's just, <laughs> that's just a thing that's going to happen. And it's just, you know, and I understand like in a, like in other hands would be like, ah, we got to cut this stuff. You know, we get it that they love each other. We don't need, but it's like, that's our Aragorn's whole thing. That's his heart. That's, yeah. that's the person he loves. That's who, like, that makes it tangible for him. That makes his fight tangible rather than, oh, I'm just the best fighter. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I love Lord of the Rings movies and, and I, it's something where I just, I feel like I've reached the point now where I just need to make them annual watches because I hadn't watched these since like 2014 and I was like mad at myself. What's your favorite of the three? Probably Fellowship. I just think Fellowship just introduces you to that world in such a, like, for, I mean, the fact that it has like a nine minute prologue and that prologue is like, you're either in or you're out. You yeah. are, you are either into, I'm going to tell you about a magic ring and the races of men and the races of elves and dwarves and there's the hidden ring. And then there's this guy, Gollum, and he takes it into the mountain and it's nine minutes long. <laughs> there's a war that happens. And again, that was another last minute addition. Like that was because in test screenings, everyone was confused. They didn't understand the world. They didn't understand the mm-hmm. rules. And that's Peter Jackson adapting and saying like, well, what can we do? Yeah. How can we, how can we fix this? Okay, well, let's shift gears a bit and talk a bit about uh, The Hobbit, which had its own sort of tortured production. Uh, Adam, do you want to clue people into what it was like (laughs) to make The Hobbit movies? I mean, (laughs) it's so long. Well, I I think first it's interesting to look at, and I, a dummy, after watching The Hobbit trilogy and getting kind of enmeshed in this, was like, do I need to see the ultimate edition of King Kong? So I ordered it off Amazon and I haven't watched it yet. Um, But like Jackson went from Lord of the Rings. He cashed in all his chips, made his big like, I'm going to do whatever I want movie, which was King Kong, which was literally released at like three hours long, which is insane to me. Uh, And I remembered that movie like bombing, but I looked it up and all the like critics were like, yeah, this is a really good movie. (laughs) What was your bond financially relative to what it cost? Okay. Um, and also, and I don't think it's held up as well. I, that's the other thing yeah. is that people just weren't, you know, and it, it's a film with these weird tangents too. Like it's sort of like these, it has, it, 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 it has all these side characters that you don't really need. Um, the skull Island stuff just goes on for a long time. Um, but like Jackson, loves, two hours. yeah. And Jack, but Jackson loves King Kong, but I think it's just, it's a really bloated film. Yeah. Um, and then he does the lovely bones, which is him trying to kind of get back the heavenly creatures. And, and I am legit angry at how bad lovely bones is. I, yeah. cause I think that book is really well done and it's just a really powerful meditation on grief and whatever they did with the script, it turns it into like a procedural thriller. Like yeah, it's, it's like just, a murder mystery. it's a murder mystery combined with like, isn't heaven fucking dope? <laughs> like Saoirse, he- <laughs> Saoirse Ronan running around like heaven being like, Oh, this is fun. Yeah. And it's just like, and, and you feel like we, Jackson has reached the point where like no one is telling him no. And then he does Tintin. I mean, Jack Spielberg is Tintin, but Jackson is a big player in that. He and produced- Tintin is not good. And Tintin is not good either. I think Tintin's uh, fun. I I watched that a couple of years ago and I was like, this is bad. It's, <laughs> it's an adventure movie that doesn't feel adventurous. Um, it, it feels overly done. You don't care about the character. Like maybe other people, like if you grew up with Tintin, you're like, yeah, Andy Serkis is Captain Haddock. Yeah, this is great. But if you're just like, if you don't really care about the Tintin comics, you're just like, these characters are boring. I still can't tell the difference between Daniel Craig's character and Andy Serkis' character from the voices in that movie. <laughs> yeah. Daniel Craig is the villain. <laughs> yeah. All right. That, that's all you but need. But then he, know. you know, and then he is going to do The Hobbit, but he's not going to do The Hobbit. So he's going to produce The Hobbit. Guillermo del Toro is going to direct The Hobbit. And he's going to. Guillermo like, del Toro moves his whole fucking life to New Zealand. Yes. But there's a rights issue. Yeah. And he's shuffling, del Toro shuffling back and forth. So he's spending like four days in New Zealand and then he's flying back home to be with his family for a few days. And then he's flying back to New Zealand and they're spending the day writing and developing. And he had designed smog 
Um, you know, he had designed a bunch of things. And at this time, The Hobbit was two movies, correct? Or was yes, it one it was movie? Be, and then no, no, two? it was going to be two movies. OK, so it was going to be The Hobbit and then it was going to be a bridge movie that would bridge between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. First. Of, yeah. So that was the first thing, I think. And then so they were going to do this bridge movie that would like start to thread in some characters from Lord of the Rings that would like lead up to it. And then while Del Toro was still attached, I think they started considering maybe dropping the bridge thing and maybe expanding the Hobbit to two books um, from what I've been reading. And then Del Toro was like, I've spent so long on this and there's no end in sight in terms of the yeah. right issues. Right. For those who don't know, basically the problem was is that MGM owned the rights to the Hobbit. And MGM was in financial meltdown. And so there were all these things happening. Like you couldn't get a new Bond movie made. You couldn't, uh, They MGM had made Joss Whedon and, and Drew Goddard's Cabin in the Woods, but they couldn't release it. Um, and it was these kind of issues that like everything was frozen basically. And it was, and so this financial mess that MGM was in bogged down everything else. Yeah. Yeah, and the, essentially the film was uh, the Hobbit was not greenlit yet. Like they didn't have a green light, and so Del Toro, you know, made this pretty emotional statement that he was walking away from the film, was moving back home, and then within days, I think, wasn't it? Wasn't it within days that Peter Jackson was announced as directing? Yeah, it happened pretty quick. Yeah, uh, and from what I've read, that was largely to keep the project from falling apart because it was going to be just like scrap it, we're done. And there and then it was like the weight of Peter Jackson would finally give the project the green light. Um, and I still remember sitting in Comic-Con a couple of years later where Peter Jackson presented The Hobbit and Guillermo del Toro presented Pacific Rim <laughs> in the same room um, and did not acknowledge one another <laughs> the whole time. I still want to know the whole story and I still want to know what del Toro's version of that would have looked like because he has co-writer credit on all three Hobbit movies. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I, I, it'd be interesting to know how it turned out. I just I also feel, though, like Peter Jackson deciding to do The Hobbit was one of the biggest mistakes of his entire career. Yeah, um, I you sometimes you just can't go home again. And I think getting not just Del Toro, but just any other director to be like, you can build your own new Middle Earth thing and I will I will be there for you as sort of a guide and I will participate, but I will not be the the, the main visionary behind this and to sort of step back behind the camera and sort of tell people like you can go home again. And it just, it spiraled wildly out of control from there. I mean, it went, <clears throat> it, it's first off, there's not enough. It, the Hobbit is not a long book. So even getting two movies out of it is a bit of a reach, but it's doable. When it went to three films, all bets were off. And, you know, and, and that's not to mention like the fact that like, oh, we're going to shoot the Hobbit in 48 frames per second. It's this new technology. It's more immersive. That's a that's a bad time to do a test, my dude. That's a bad well, time. It, to. It was literally going home again because it was the same thing that happened on Lord of the Rings, which was changing a lot of stuff during and after filming. So it was two movies like the Was it still the summer? It was still two movies and the movie was coming out in the winter at Christmas. And then after that summer, I think. Because there was this big, long Comic-Con poster, I remember, that had, like, the the Hobbit and Unexpected Journey, and included on there was, like, the barrel scene and the bear, like, stuff that, like, they then made the decision months before it opened to change it into three movies, so they just lopped stuff off. Jackson, like, beefed up some of the other scenes um, with, you know, unused footage and stuff, and turned it into three movies, which was just... A terrible decision. <laughs> well, and there's just and that thing is there's just terrible decisions galore. I mean, not just yeah. from like let's make it three movies and let's move stuff around. You know, when I was saying like even Faramir has a character arc, like you just don't get character arcs no. in the Hobbit trilogy, really. Like I mean, movies. you get you get Bilbo and you get Thorin, you know, and you know, it's neat to see like kind the, of though. Kind but of. Like the, so my problem, so rewatching this trilogy again, so I okay. watched the extended editions, having never seen the extended editions. And for one, the 4K is definitely worth getting because it looks like real movies. So as Matt mentioned, the high frame rate thing, that was an experiment that just did not work. They looked like soap operas. And the worst thing was that it looked like a set. And Jackson was like, well, your eyes have to adjust. Like you have to, 
you know, it'll take about 45 minutes for your eyes to adjust, or it may take two or three viewings for your eyes to adjust because you're literally trying to teach your eyes to see things that it has not seen before or to view an image in a way that it hasn't seen it before. But to me, it just looked like sets. They looked like a soap opera. And the whole magic of Lord of the Rings is that that world felt tactile. So that's fixed in the 4K. They feel it feels like the world. It feels like Lord of the Rings again, kind of, um, even though the color scheme is is a bit different. Um, and the extended editions, you know, it is, you know, the Howard Shore score is back. So it is kind of nice to luxuriate in this world. The problem, as you said, is The Hobbit is a, too short of a book. So you're stretching things way out. And you're like, well, people like dwarves, so let's have dwarves singing for like an entire movie. <laughs> let's just do a whole movie of dwarves singing songs. And then, oh, they almost get eaten and they're going to get cooked and they're just like bumbling. It, and it's all played for physical comedy. And like, it's just too much of that. Like, as you said, like it, it, there's no character arcs. Like I know there's like even in the extended editions, I don't know their names. Like there's the fat dwarf and there's, there's the hand, dwarf there's with handsome the dwarf. Horse. There's and then hot there's... dwarf. There's yes. old dwarf. There's yeah. You, yeah. Old dwarf actually, I will say old dwarf, and I still don't know his name. Had does uh, improve in the extended editions because he's <sighs> become sort of this. Um, and I'm sure Tolkien fans absolutely hate me right now because uh, I can't remember the names or the history. But like he becomes kind of this voice of reason for Thorin because he saw Thorin's dad get, uh, um, you know, uh, what is it called? Like dragon lust or dragon, oh. sick, dragon sickness, oh, dragon sickness. gold sickness or whatever. <laughs> You're like, oh, yes, of course, dragon sickness. Uh, anyway, like he saw Thorin's dad go through this same spiral and he's trying to prevent that from happening again. He's kind of like, I've been through this before and kind of these early warning signs and stuff. So he does improve in the extended editions. But yeah, like you just like even Bilbo is just kind of because you're expanding because there are so many scenes that don't really matter. Um, and even in theatrical theatrical editions, this was the same case. You would have either scenes where it's just a bunch of, you know, indistinguishable dwarves singing or throwing things at each other um, or people talking about stuff that doesn't matter. It's just like it's hard to care. Yeah. And I mean, I, and there's just so many baffling decisions like, OK, so there's going to be this like orc antagonist with a twig for a hand and he's going to constantly be coming after him. But we're going to make sure he's see, completely CGI. And it's like, why? We know what a good orc looks like. You have the makeup. We've care like it's it was super effective in Lord of the Rings. Why are you just making it all CGI? Like, I get why they Sauron, shot it with the makeup, actually. And that's the thing. That? They shot it with the makeup <laughs> thing and they went to the worst option. Like, I get why like smog is all CG because like it's a giant dragon. Like, there's no way yeah. to do that practically. But there is a practical way to do orcs. You showed it to us and then you abandoned it for the worst option. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and especially in battle of the five armies, you can see Jackson having not been able to make his Tintin movie is working in the realm of like uh, motion capture with like mm -hmm. all digital characters. And so he's able to get in the volume with his camera and use all these CG creations and like create shots with actors who are not there. And like tell them how like, you know, he can literally move the characters this way and that the extended edition of Battle of Five Armies is rated R and it is hilarious. Uh, the like just violence that happens in the battle because <laughs> it's just like ogres like chopping heads off and like just blood splurting everywhere. It's only like it's like maybe six or seven scenes where that happens, like during the whole like climactic battle. But it does like come out of nowhere. But but it's so, and that's so bizarre because again, The Hobbit is really more of a children's book. Yes. It's really more of like a simple journey story. It doesn't like the fact that like you had to go to an R rating just says to me, like the wheels completely came off. Yeah. It's just very much like they gave me the money to make extended editions and like, why not do something that like, you know, I like blood. It wouldn't it be kind of cool if you get to see a bunch of heads getting chopped off in this yeah. epic battle. <laughs> It's like, OK, yeah. I guess so. But it's so CG soaked, uh, which you honestly a little bit of like Return to the King. You can start to see a bit of Jackson. Yeah, relying on like the CG Battle tools. of Pelennor Fields with, again, like the green ghosts just kind of wipe everything out. And, yeah. Yeah. Which is why I think the Battle of Helm's Deeps holds up so well, because it was using cutting edge technology, uh, this program called Massive, where you could program like a bunch of digital characters and they would they would act independently. So you wouldn't have to program each individual mm -hmm. character to do yeah. something. But because that technology was still a little bit rudimentary and it didn't look great close up, you still had to rely on close ups and cutaways of people in full on, like really genuinely terrifying orc makeup, uh, which like I think added that level. Whereas in 
the Hobbit movies is just a cartoon character. <laughs> I mean, the fact that you like have a scene where like Legolas is jumping between falling stones and you could add in the Mario jump sound effect yeah. and nothing would be different. <laughs> yeah. Like tells me kind of all you need to know about sort of where Jackson's head is at. It's just off the rails. It's like they gave me three movies and so I got to make it three movies worth. So I'm just going to do a bunch of action stuff like that. And, you know, the action stuff is kind of fun and 4K. It looks pretty good. Uh, it, it You just don't care about anything that's happening <laughs> at all. Yeah, it's just it's such a you know, weird way, kind of like, even though it's a prequel, it's a tragic conclusion to yeah. like this sort of great story about like Peter Jackson beating the odds with, with this great Lord of the Rings trilogy. And then you kind of come back to the well and it's sort of like, well, the Star Wars fans got their prequels and, and now the Lord of the Rings fans have their prequels. Yeah. And it's just, you know, I guess I'm waiting for the Iron Man prequels now. <laughs> <It's just> like <laughs> yes. high school Tony Stark. Yeah. I don't know. It's just it. It is very frustrating. Um, you could just see. I think he was just enamored of the technology. It feels like I don't know. Yeah. And again, I I think you're right. I think the fatal flaw is the book is too short. Like it does not need to be three movies. That is yeah. that is that is the most frustrating aspect I found of it because there are little pieces and little scenes that work. I really like the Lord of the Rings stuff that was added into it from the appendices. Um, so like Gandalf going to, I think it's called Dal Guldur or whatever, that's alluding to the arrival, like the re-emergence of Sauron. Like that stuff is pretty fun because you get Hugo Weaving back and Kate Blanchett. Um, and this stuff's like spooky, kind of like Haunted House-esque. That stuff's pretty cool. But then um, at the same time, you have like, here's Radagast and he has bird shit in his hair. Yes, he comes to the rescue. This bird shit Radagast. Ugh, it's yeah, it's very frustrating. And you're like, you know, how many years of his like how many other movies could he have made in that time that may have been better? I mean, well, and the thing is, you I'm ask that, but, you know, it's been five years now since um, Battle of the Five Armies or what was Battle of the Five Armies 2014 or 2015? <laughs> Um, yeah, 2014, 2014. So now I've been six years since Battle of the Five Armies and he kind of directed Mortal Engines. Yeah. Um, but and then he just he's sort of like, I'm just going to do documentaries. I'm going to do these sort of restorative documentaries. So he did, um, you know, oh, gosh, what was it that may they never grow old mm -hmm. or they shall never grow old. Um, and now, good. yeah. And, and now he's working on a Beatles documentary. Yeah. Of restoring that footage. And I think that's fine. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just like, I don't know. I feel like maybe if there is something good that could, came out of the Hobbit movies, it's maybe a little humility for Peter Jackson. Um, and to sort of, because, because I, again, as bad as the Hobbit movies can be, they don't hold a candle to how bad the lovely bones is. Yes, that's true. So, you know, if, if you can humble him, cause then I was really like, I'm a big, beautiful creatures fan. Um, so I was really looking forward to Lovely Bones and the, the, the fact that that film is so disappointing, yeah. uh, sticks in my craw. I just love the story of Brian Gosling showing up, like having gained 40 pounds just as a character choice. And Peter Jackson's like, no, no <laughs> you're fired. <laughs> no, <laughs> get me the fittest man who, that you can find. And then like Mark Wahlberg's phone rings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you want to see what he looked like, uh, watch Lars and the Real Girl. That was he had shed some of the weight, but that was how <laughs> Ryan Gosling showed up. I want to just what a film. great choice. <laughs> but also, like Ryan Gosling was like twenty seven at the time, and so it was like he was just playing like a cast... father of three. Yeah, yeah, it was just Weird. odd casting anyway. So yeah. yeah, that movie sucks. That movie sucks. Um, all right, anything else to say about Hobbit or Lord of the Rings? I mean, all of this being said, I'm going to sound crazy. It's worth checking out on 4K. And as Matt said, like, there's no so there are no bonus features on these two 4K releases that just came out. And they're doing a full, complete all six films release in 2021 that they said will have a new bonus feature on it. But neither of these releases will include the bonus features that are on the existing DVDs and Blu-rays. So hold on to those. Don't get rid of those. But if you just want to watch, like if you want to watch the films and enjoy them immediately, I, you know, I, I don't know. I didn't have a bad time watching the Hobbit trilogy. I thought it was going to be awful, but especially watching the extended editions by myself uh, for the first time, it was just like, oh, okay, yeah. And I, they're and not I, great, I, but they're fascinating. Yeah, and I, I fell in love with the Lord of the Rings movies all over again. Those movies are just have not, they have not diminished with age at all. Yeah. They're just fantastic. Um, all right, well, with that, let's uh, let's move on to recently watched.
Uh, what have you seen lately? Um, so I started binging the HBO Max series, The Flight Attendant, and we ended up watching way too many episodes. <laughs> uh, it's based on a book. It's this kind of like mystery thriller, but like with a kind of fun mid-century modern flair to it story. Uh, it's a limited series on HBO Max, so it's close-ended, seven episodes. The finale is this week. Essentially, the conceit is Kayla Cuoco plays a flight attendant who has a one night stand in Thailand while on, you know, she flew as part of the flight crew uh, with a guy played by Michelle Huisman, who you may uh, know from The Haunting of Hill House uh, and uh, Game of Thrones. Um, and she wakes up the next day and his throat's been slit. And she, for reasons that may or may not become clear later on, decides not to tell anyone. She decides to clean up the murder scene and get out of his hotel room and not tell a soul. Um, but it kind of sets into motion this like mystery thriller that she's kind of thrown off the deep end into. Um, but it's also, so her character is an alcoholic who will not admit that she's an alcoholic. So it has this, and it, I don't know, at every turn it felt like it could have gone really poorly or it could have been the setup for a really bad show. Um, but it's got this really compelling murder mystery aspect where you're kind of wondering like what exactly happened to this guy and who was he and who did it. Um, but also just a really compelling, like, uh, like fully fledged character arc at the center of it, where this woman, her story becomes more important than the whodunit. And you actually care more about her story and her arc than the whodunit, which is a really hard trick to pull off. I mean, you've seen countless other shows try and do that. And Kaylee Cuoco blew me away. She's really fantastic in it. Um, it's also a show where like, it, it does not go and notice that like every single role that would traditionally be played by a man in this kind of thing is played by a woman. So uh, her coworker who has a really fulfilling character arc of her own, is played by Rosie Perez, who was really great in the show. Uh, her best friend is played by Zasha Mamet. Even the authorities, like the FBI agent, the main FBI agent is a woman. One of the main antagonists is a woman, uh, and she's fantastic. And it doesn't change anything. And it like the the show is populated with really good looking men in supporting roles as like, you know, the boyfriend or the fling or whatever, which is traditionally it's flipped. And that's how every other story happens. Uh, and so it was kind of neat to like see, you know, it passes the Bechtel test in more ways than one, which I, I don't necessarily think a movie has to pass the Bechtel test to be good. But it is fascinating to watch women characters have conversations about things that aren't men or like, you know, have interior lives of their own that they're sharing with each other. Uh, it just adds this new this other dimension to it that shouldn't feel fresh and refreshing. Um, but it is. Uh, and I've seen the finale and the finale is great. Finales are hard. Uh, endings are hard. I was kind of worried that it wouldn't stick to landing. But I don't know. I just had a lot of fun with it. And if I assume if you're listening to this, you're probably going to get HBO Max to watch Wonder Woman 1984. Uh, and the flight attendant is well worth your time. Each episode is like 45 minutes long. And again, it's a close ended story, seven episodes, and you'll probably have a ton of fun with it. So I would suggest checking it out. Nice. Um, I'm going to throw you a bit of a curveball because I said before we started recording, I was going to talk about Mangrove, but I think I'm going to hold off onto that one until I finish the Small Axe series. Uh, but you reminded me during this conversation about the uh, fantasy films. I saw Legend this past week. <laughs> I'd never seen Legend before. And I saw the theatrical version. Um, and I had always, until this year, I had always gotten Willow and Legend confused because they're both 80s fantasy movies. Uh, and now I've sil finally seen Willow and now I've finally seen Legend. Legend is bad. Um, <laughs> I don't know if the extent, I mean, we had a, we had a freelancer, Todd Gilchrist, write about the different Ridley Scott director's cuts. And he says that the director's cut of Legend is is better significantly better but it's going to take me a while to seek that out because like it's just you you go into legend and it's just all fantasy imagery like there's not yeah. really much in the way of characters um there's not much in the way of plot even really like it's, it has something to do with like you know the devil wants a unicorn horn um <laughs> and like and and tom cruise and some some sort of forest creatures are trying to stop him it's just bad. It's like, it's just, it's, I mean, Ridley Scott knows how to do his visuals and like the VFX makeup or not VFX, the special effects makeup is, is very well done. I mean, Tim Curry looks fantastic as the devil um, or Lord of darkness as they call him in this movie. Um, but as a film, it was just, it's kind of a slog. Um, it's not that fun. Um, I guess if you like, you might like it if like you saw it as a kid and it has like a special place in your heart as sort of like a nostalgia play. But I, again, I hadn't seen it till th now. And I was just sort of like, well, I guess I can check that Ridley Scott movie off my <laughs> list and that Tom Cruise movie off my list. Um, oof. 
I legend. watched it for the first time when I ranked the Tom Cruise movies mm-hmm. a few years ago, um, and I hated it. <laughs> it just felt like a music video. Like the Tangerine Dream score is good, but it like I, I was with you. I was like, there's no story. There's no characters. Like, what is this? It's all hazy and like slow motion and just tons of fog. Yeah. And people got really mad that I put it low on my list. So How dare probably, you, sir? How dare just you? just pissed off a lot of people. But it does feel like something that, like, if you were super into Labyrinth and you watched it, maybe you liked it as a kid. But watching it as, like, an adult, I was like, this is not for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, I've heard, you know, I've, I've heard that the extended version is better. Uh, maybe I'll watch that one day. I mean, as, and Ridley Scott director's cuts do have a tendency to be better yeah. than their theatrical counterparts. Mm-hmm. Um so, yeah. Um, well, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, as we've said, uh, we are now available on wherever you get your podcast from. So uh, whether it's Apple, Stitcher, Overcast, wherever you get them, you can find the Collider podcast. Also, for the rest of the year, we are doing two podcasts a week. So our podcast later this week will be on season two of The Mandalorian. We're going to watch that season finale Friday morning and then Friday afternoon. We're going to talk about the whole season and uh, you can just tune in when you finish, when you've caught up with uh, The Mandalorian and all the favors he's doing people. So <laughs> that'll be our, our podcast later this week. If you want to keep up with uh, us, you should follow us on Twitter. Adam, where can we find you on Twitter? At Adam Chitwood. And you can find me at Matt Goldberg. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be with you later this week. Thank you.